Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 22 of the Gateway Project, and here we are in orbit at the KSS number one with Bob. He's going out on an EVA right now because he's going to show us some of the things that have been changed. My frame rate was getting pretty low, so I had to make some changes to improve the frame rate like I've done in a past episode. One of the biggest changes is I have modified the S0's part file to include these large beams. If you remember in a past episode, I was having trouble with the Kerbin, Kerbal attachment system struts. And so I went in and I made a change to put beams in instead. I'll explain in a bit how I actually do that. You can see I've done a similar thing over here where I took out some docking nodes that I decided I don't really need and put in some cubic struts as well as some batteries and some ammonia tanks on the side here because the P6 has that same thing. And uh, I wanted to have batteries just for the consistency and the ammonia tanks for the consistency between all the parts. Moving our way down to the other side of the station, you can see that because that docking node is out now, this uh, ICC for the uh, ESP3 is hooked up directly to the truss segment. Uh, also, between both of them, you can see that I have taken out some of the little struts. I also went back to the part files and I modified them to have interiors. So all the little compartments now have interiors, which means that the Kerbals are showing up in the bottom right hand corner of the map. So that's pretty good. Now I can access all of them. We can do IVAs to look at what it's like to be inside one of these compartments staring out through the window. Uh, this is Bob's view. And then we have either uh, Filmy or Kerbeam here. Uh, we'll switch between the two of them and they can see only these little tiny windows in their bays. Uh, but anything that I have that's an internal view, I would be able to show as one of those. It's just I selected the crew cabin for my interiors. We'll come back and I'll explain a little bit about the details of what I did uh, a little bit more. But right now, some people have been asking me to show how I do different cinematic things. And you can see I'm opening up my curb cam here and setting my relativity to the station itself, the core of the station. And then I create what's a, a, just a simple path and you put a frame. And then when you want another keyframe, you put that one by hitting that button there that says new key. And you scroll uh, between the two frames where you want your first one and where you want your second one. You just hit key, new keyframe for each one. And now when I click play up in that little curb cam thing, it will fly from the first keyframe down to the second keyframe and I can just set the times and where I want to view and I can set the use the camera controls to move around to the different locations and by doing that I set up a complete path that goes across the whole station flies by whatever I wanted to do sweeping cameras you name it anything goes you just hit play you hit record and there you go you've got your video and then I just sort of bake that up into something that I can use by going into my editor and adding some uh, like subtitles uh, where you see the project gateway Kerbal space program with all the glowy letters and all that that's coming from my power director 12 uh, editor all right so you want to know how I get my frame rate to come up it was probably running at about five frames per second and I had to boost that up because I just couldn't play at that level. So by making a couple tweaks, I was able to get it up to 16. Now, what are those tweaks? Well, there's basically just two big things that I do. One of them is I modify the part files to remove even additional parts. Another thing that I can do is take out docking connectors because it seems like when it, the game thinks that there's extra ships around, it sl slows everything down where maybe it's processing physics or something on them. Okay, so we're docking up on our PMA here because we're going to bring up the Harmony now. The Harmony module needs to dock where that PMA is supposed to be. And so we're going to move that away. And we're coming around with the launch site underneath the orbit. And while I'm looking here, I'm seeing that the actual KSS, see how it's down at the bottom of the screen there? It's going around to the backside. We're basically exactly opposite each other right now as mission control goes under. I decide that I don't actually want to do that. I want to see where we're going to be relative to the, uh, uh, the KSS as we come over one more time. So we zoom ahead 
and notice that it went about one quarter of a turn around the planet. Ooh, so that means if I go one more time, it's going to be going over mission control. So we're going to go one more time because I'll tell you what, I like the challenge. I like the challenge of trying to get from the surface straight to the, the station right through the launch. So we brought it around here and look at that. Sure enough, it's coming over mission control. So now we can try to make a launch that goes directly from the surface to the station. And if this works out again, like it has a couple times in the past where I've just gotten lucky that mission control was going under at the same time, I think from now on this is how I'm going to do it because it's just fun. I love going from the surface straight to the station. So in fact, to show whether or not this is going to work and kind of how I go about doing it because maybe you'd like to do something like that too, I'm actually going to show this entire launch. I'm going to speed up little bits of it, but I'm going to show the whole launch just in case there's something in there that you see that helps you out in trying to do the exact same thing. So I'm going to start speeding up the thing here now. It's going almost three times normal speed as far as the launch goes, but I think that I should still have enough time to describe what's going on. Uh, so at this point, I have launched underneath the orbit and I'm heading up there along that 135 degree vector because that happens to be where the orbit's going right now. Over on the left hand side, you see that window that says flight computer. That is my MechJab window and in there I have customized it with a bunch of different things that I find useful for when I'm flying. Now in particular, right now because we're trying to go in a rendezvous with something, what I'm looking at is that section that says closest approach distance and relative inclination. This whole time I've been keeping my eye on that relative inclination, trying to uh, get it lower. And when I see that it stops going lower, that probably means that I have crossed over the orbit, relatively speaking. And uh, at that point I can go and I can look at the orbit itself, which is right about here. So you can see now I'm checking out the orbit and I know that uh, I'm roughly where I need to be so I'm going to try to point more prograde now by pointing prograde with it kind of in the right inclination only off by a couple degrees that's going to try and get my apoapsis and my uh, ascending node all at the same place at the same time with that maneuver node if I pull on the blue that's coming away from Kerbin if I pull on that blue that lifts the nose of the craft and if I do the prograde one, then of course I'm going to go faster. And then I can also use my inclination ascending and descending those purple ones. And by doing that, I'm able to set up while still lifting off the node that will allow me to see what blue marker on my nav ball I need to go to in order to get to the target. Additionally, I'm watching that closest approach distance. I turn off the uh, actual SAS here that's holding my node. That way I can see on my closest approach distance how far away I am. And notice it's getting lower, lower, 1K, and there it is. It's 200 meters away. So now I have a rendezvous straight from the surface up. Now I just make one more maneuver right there where the ascending node, the apoapsis, and the close approach were all meeting. And you do it again until you see that the uh, close approach lines up once more. And when that does, you've lined up your orbit. You can look at it from the side to try and do your ascending, and you can look at it from the top in order to get your prograde marker. I think doing it this way really speeds up the launches. So I think from now on, this is how I want to do it. I'm going to just wait for mission control to go under the orbit while the KSS is going overhead. And if that means I have to go one more time around Kerbin, that's probably a little quicker to just warp speed through that and get to the right place uh, than it would be to have to uh, go up into orbit and then figure out how to do my rendezvous, which sometimes takes multiple revolutions anyway. And here we are at the KSS. We are coming in to deliver the Harmony module. This was originally named Node 2, but it was renamed in March of 2007 after some kindergartners were uh, get entered into a contest. They had to learn about the ISS and make a scale model of the ISS, as well as write an essay that proposed a new name for it. And uh, they put in a whole bunch of submissions and of those, one was selected and it was Harmony. So I think that's pretty cool. 
This was launched on Discovery, the Space Shuttle Discovery STS-120 in October 2007, and it acts like a science hub for the station. It has four special racks inside that are all devoted to power and science. Also, the internal living space volume, because it's a fairly big module, uh, it provided the equivalent relatively to the amount of space that's out there now, like uh, a whole, adding a whole new bedroom to your house. It was 20% more internal living volume once they had that thing docked up. It has six docking nodes on it, and we're going to use the one that you can see that little pixie mini tug on right now, uh, it's going to come off after the PMA gets attached to the side that's currently where the decoupler is. So uh, when we get that all hooked up, we'll stick that in there on that side. And then over the course of time, uh, after the PMA2 is docked on the other side, of course, uh, we will then eventually be able to dock onto it the Columbus module as well as the ELM. And I will cover in much more detail more about those modules when the time comes to actually have them at the station. So now we have decoupled, we can go and deorbit this injection stage here, as well as over on the uh, KSS itself, we need to get that PMA and have it pulled back and ready for us to bring this new module in. One interesting fact I think about the STS-120, when it went up, it had on board Luke Skywalker's lightsaber from Return of the Jedi because they were honoring the 30th anniversary of Star Wars. And after it went up to the ISS and came back down again later, uh, it was moved to the Houston Space Center where it now sits on display in their museum. Which, by the way, this summer I am going to go and visit the Houston Space Center as part of my vacation so I might be able to see that lightsaber and that's gonna be pretty cool so the method you're seeing here where I'm going out with the little pixie on one side and the other tug that's gonna go on the other side hooking up the PMA this is not even remotely close to the same way that it was done in the real world in the real world the uh, space shuttle connected up to the docking port and then reached out with its robotic arm attaching the module, the Harmony module here, to the port side of Unity, where they then took the PMA and put that up on top of Harmony, and then took Harmony with the PMA together, like you're seeing now where I have the little tug on here, and then took that in and then docked it onto the front of uh, Destiny. Now if I tried to do something like that, either with a space shuttle or even just with a robotic arm, it would take forever and I would probably pull my hair out because it would be uh, just too difficult to do with the, the jitteriness of how things work in KSP sometimes. So instead, uh, that's one of the reasons why I keep on using these rockets rather than shuttles. And there we go, we are docked in place and it's time for Bill inside, not Bill, for Bob inside to go and hook up whatever cables are necessary to activate the power racks that are inside. We won't actually have to watch any of that because he's just floating around in the station doing his thing right now. Meanwhile, they're also bringing in the radiators on the P6 because it's time to put the P6 in its final home. We're gonna take this off of the Z and bring it down over to the end of P, putting it in place and that finishes that entire port side of the solar panel truss. This is gonna be cool. We'll also be able to get rid of that little tug there, which will then give me a better idea of the part count that I have, and it'll get rid of one of the docking nodes. So we'll have a pretty good idea what the actual size of the station is here any moment now. So we're going to slide this one down there and gently push that forward. Oh, this is gonna be good. Here we go. Wait for it. Stay on target. Stay on target. And bam! That's it. We have the port done. We have to put out the solar panels and maybe rotate it to get a little bit more sun. But that side is done and pretty soon we're going to be doing the uh, S side. And when we do the S6, 
the whole thing from one end down to the other is going to be done. And look at this beautiful night shot. I hope you are in a dark room because if you aren't, watch this in a dark room where it really shows up. That's just beautiful at night. With a third solar panel now fully functional, I'm just going to bring out all the radiators, rotate them to point them away from the sun, and also rotate the actual solar panels to face the sun. They're not quite lined up, so we're going to rotate the station as well, aiming it off toward that sun, and now all comes the power. Back at Minmus, Jebediah has received orders from Krantz Kerman of Mission Control, and he says that it's time for Bill to go and investigate the anomaly. So Bill is going to go out there and EVA his way with his jetpack in this low gravity environment all the way down to the anomaly where he is going to investigate it. Let's listen in to see what they're saying. Well now, it looks like we have some data to analyze in the next episode, but in this one we have to send some cargo up to the Minmus station. They are currently lacking in a little bit of life support, the snacks were running dry. All they have left is the regular rations and they get cranky when they're down to regular rations. So we are sending up a hydrocargo carrier that is going to take their precious snacks over to the Minmus space station. Additionally, we need to give them some extra fuel so that if they want to use their craft to either go down to the surface or come back up to the station even, or come back home to Kerbin, uh, they can do that. So off they go. Also in the next episode, We'll be moving into the events of 2008 as we bring up the Columbus European Laboratory module. This hydrocargo carrier will make it to Minmus and oh man, look at that. That is such a beautiful little sight right there. You got the little halo glow around the planet and the sun in the background while the panels open up. Ah, oh, so good. Anyway, we'll get this to Minmus next time and do a bunch of other stuff too. Until next time, I'll see you later, Kerbinauts.